Okay, folks, it's time and we should get started. Um, for the next three sessions, I will start the class by asking a good question. It's meant to be a nag, and I, you know, I'm not going to apologize for it, but this may, you know, I want to make sure people get into groups, pick a company, and get started. How many of you are not in groups yet? Okay. One thing you might want to consider is keep your hands up because at the end of today's class, maybe meeting people who are not in a group and saying, would you like to create a group? It might work, it might not work, but think of match, it's like a matchmaking service. No, basically, so to try to get into a group as soon as you can, but don't wait till you get into a group to pick a company because in a sense, you can pick a company and as long as you meet one or two constraints, Nobody's going to say, no, you got to change companies. So keep those processes going on parallel paths. So let me ask the second question. How many of you have picked a company to value? Okay, so we're getting started at least. So I'll keep asking this question. Hopefully by the end of next week, you'll have a company you're going to value. And as I said, don't, no, don't go back and forth. Just pick a company. You can always change your mind. So at the start of every class for the remaining 25 sessions, I'm gonna start with what I call a start of the class quiz. And I'm gonna tell you what I'm gonna do. And it's gonna sound incredibly weird, but kind of hang in there. I'm gonna quiz you on what we're gonna be doing over the rest of the class. Kind of silly, right? You haven't done, but the point I'm gonna make is if you can answer these questions, you can reason your way through pretty much everything that's gonna to come to the class. My point is nothing I'm going to talk about should be mind blowing. It should be pretty much common sense and you should be able to reason your way there and hopefully you'll find that out as you take the start of the class. Today, for instance, we're gonna talk a lot about what I call the three big enemies of evaluation. The first of those is bias. And we'll talk more about bias, but bias comes from multiple places. What you already know about a company, what you think about a company, whether you like the management or not. So let's start with with a question. So each of these, here's what I want you to do. I'm gonna put you in a scenario where you're valuing a company. And I want you to tell me in this particular setting, are you likely to come up with too low a number, too high a number, or there's no bias? So you ready? Here's the first scenario. You are the founder of a business. A venture capitalist or a private equity investor has approached you because they want to buy your business. You valued your own business for sale. It's an easy one. Is your bias going to be to come up with too high a number or too low a number? Too high a number because you're selling it. You want to get the highest price, right? So you get on Shark Tank, you don't low ball the offer. You go high ball the offer, hoping that somebody jumps in. On the other side of the transaction, if you're a venture capitalist looking at the same business, your bias is to come up with a lower value because the lower the value, the way it'll play out, the higher the percentage of the company you will get for whatever you invest. Now the levers you use to change your value are going to depend on the company, right? So if you're all about users, if you're the founder, you're going to overestimate the number of users you're going to have in three years or five years. And the VC is going to push back and lowball that number. 
So you can see the bias comes from which side of the table you're sitting on. Now let's move to a very different, perhaps less sexy scenario. You're an appraiser and you've been called in by a person who's just you know, had a nasty divorce. They own a business. Your job is to appraise the value of the business so the soon to be ex-spouse who you don't like anymore can get half of that value. Um, we won't make this about Bill and Melinda Gates or Jeff Bezos. And no, it could be any, any pair breaking up. There is publicly traded. So it wasn't an issue, but it's a private business. Good appraisal. So this again is an easy one. You're appraising the value of a business. You can give away half to somebody you don't like. What's your optimal value for this business? If, if, if you're the owner and I value it, what would you like to see as the number? Zero, right? Because half of zero is? Zero, so you can go, go to your ex pause and say, my business is worth nothing. Half of nothing is nothing. I mean, of course, on the other side of the transaction, if you're the appraiser for that, that person, you're gonna come up with as high a number as possible. Again, bias comes from which side of the table you're on. Oh, I'm sorry. Now let's assume that you're the appraiser of a business. You know that you know, almost 60 to 70% of all private company appraisals are not for transactions, they're for tax purposes. So the way this works out is you value the business and then the tax guy takes away 30% of that value. So if you're the owner of a business and you're appraising a business for tax purposes, are you gonna shoot low or shoot high? You're gonna go low. If you look at tax appraisals, people always lowball the number. And of course they'll back it up with a, with a spreadsheet and assumptions but if you're on the other side of the transaction, the appraiser for the IRS, you're gonna come up with a higher number. I'll tell you, it'll, go, it'll play out in almost every choice you make in valuation. I'll give you a classic example. A few years ago, I was asked to come in and talk to a, a group of, uh, I mean, these were people who were either worked at utilities or were regulators looking at utilities. And for those of you not familiar with how utilities are regulated in the US, Regulators set prices, allow you to set prices on power or water based upon your cost of equity. And they try to you know, set the prices so your return in equity is equal to the cost of equity. Their, their end game is to try to, so you can earn just enough money to cover your cost of equity. So both the utility and the regulator try to estimate the cost of equity. So you ready? If you're on the utility side of the equation, when you try to estimate your cost of equity, Remember, this cost of equity is now going to become the basis as to whether you get a price raise or not on your products and services. You want to come up with the highest cost of equity you can, right? Because the higher the cost of equity, the more you can say, look, I need to raise my prices. I need to make a 14% cost of equity. In terms of mechanics, then, if you think about the inputs that go into cost of equity, and we'll talk more about this, you got a risk-free rate. Not much you can do with that, though you could try to normalize and the T-bond rate looks too low. You got a beta and with the utility, you can't claim your beta is two or three or five because utilities are pretty mature businesses. So guess which number people pump up to make their cost of equity look high? 8% equity risk premium. Where do you get that? I looked at stocks versus T-bills over the last hundred years. Of course, you back it up with data, but you want to come up with a high equity risk premium because you end up with a high cost of equity and charge high prices. And of course, the utility hires its own appraiser and that appraiser goes in the other direction. They use today's risk-free rate. They won't normalize it, definitely not. They stick with pretty much the same beta, but they will use the lowest equity risk premium they can get away with. Maybe over the last 20 years, it was three and a half percent, we'll use that instead. Your choices might look like they're objective choices, but they reflect your bias in this process. Now let's get to more complex scenarios. Any of you planning to be sell-side equity research analysts? No? Right, okay. Everybody is familiar with how equity research is, is broken up, right? You have sell-side equity research analysts and buy-side equity research analysts. Sell-side equity research analysts work for JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, the big investment banks. They turn out these equity research reports with buy and sell recommendations. And then they offer this as a free service to clients of the bank, free service. So you think, why would banks do something 
that altruistic. They're not being altruistic. What do they hope to get in return? That the people who use this research will then trade through the bank or use the bank as their intermediary. So you're a sell side equity research analyst. You have three different constituencies you got to keep happy. The first is the clients and they want the best research you can turn out. The second is within the investment bank, your bosses, because remember the investment bank, they make money off these companies. They want to generate, you know, off your clients. So basically investment bank is, and finally you have the companies that you're tracking. You're saying, why do I need to keep them happy? The way sales at equity research is structured, in my view, is very odd. You're hired as a sales side equity research analyst at Goldman Sachs. You're given 20 companies to track. That's your sector and you track them essentially for the rest of your life. Depressing thought, for the rest of your life, the same 20 companies. You're saying, so what? If you're a sell side equity research analyst and you're looking at putting buy or sell recommendations, do you think given these three groups that you're going to be tilted towards one side or the other, more buy or sell or more sell than buy? Anybody want to try as a sell side, yeah? And tell me why, how does that keep your, so set the clients to the side because there's gonna be a potential conflict there. Why does it make your investment banking bosses happy? So basically you worry about investment banking business, the Chinese wall, people climb over it and through it, all kinds of you know, holes through it. So first is you have invest, so your, your bosses like it because by recommendation makes friends and friends use your business more. The company, of course, loves a buy recommendation on it because you're saying, saying good things about the company. Your clients have mixed feelings about the whole thing because you're supposed to be giving them honest advice and all they get is buy, 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 buy. Conversely, if you put a sell recommendation, you piss off pretty much everybody, right? Your investment banking bosses say, what the heck did you do? Tesla is one of our biggest clients. They're going to have a capital raise in two months. You put a sell recommendation on Tesla. And Tesla, of course, hates it. And remember, you got to work with these 20 companies for the rest of your life. You know how journalists talk about burning their sources and why they don't want to do it? Once you burn a source, what happens? That source will never talk to you. If you're a sell side equity research analyst and you say the word sell, you might have burnt your bridges with that company from that point on. So when you call the company, and remember, you know, formally they can't give you information because that's illegal by SE, but informally you get little hints of we're doing better than expect, our inventory is now, is running down. That is now done because you put a sell recommendation on it. This manifests in a very simple statistic. Last year, there were nine times more buy recommendations than sell recommendations, nine times. And that's an improvement over 20 years ago where there were 20 times more buy recommendations than sell recommendations. Sell side equity research analysts hate using the word sell. And sometimes they come up with, I would say clever, but no, you can make your own judgment on it. Ways of saying sell without ever saying sell. Some sell side equity research houses have numerical scores for companies from one through five. So let's say you want to put a sell recommendation on a stock. Rather than say sell, what do you do? So we move the stock from two to three and you got to read the subtext and just sell and get the heck out of here. Or they have this strong buy, the, the slippery words, strong buy, semi-strong buy, weak buy, weak sell. I don't even know what a weak buy is. How exactly do you weakly buy something? I mean, I use online brokerage. Do I hit the key really hard? Do I double click the buy when it's a strong buy as opposed to a single click? But basically it's their way of saying we've lowered the company from a strong buy to a weak buy. That's a sell recommendation, even if it doesn't look like one because it says buy in the recommendation. Sell side equity research has always had a bias towards buys because of the way it's structured. Now let's get into perhaps the most biased process of all, which is M&A. I'm going to be the acquiring company in an M&A transaction. You're going to be my banker. I come to you 
And I say, look, I'm planning to do an acquisition. Can you value the target company for me? Now, before we go any further, how do you get paid as a banker in an M&A transaction? You get paid for the assessment of value you do on the target company? No, you get paid on the deal. So already you can see the biases start to form, right? Do you want the deal to go through? Heck yes, you want the deal to go through because if you don't, if it doesn't, you don't make, get paid. Do you think there might be a wee bit of bias here in this process where you say, you know what? I want this transaction to go through. And the way you make it go through is you make the target company value much higher. You're saying, how am I going to pull that off? Well, to begin with, you start to use optimistic numbers on revenues and growth. But then you pull off this, this rabbit out of your hat, where you basically say, I've come up with a value. It's not high enough. I want to make it higher. And you start adding premiums for control, for synergy. You just make up numbers, add 20%, add 30%. And guess what? When you're all done, every deal looks good. As the banker for the acquiring company, your job is to make the deal look good. And the deal looks good if the value is higher than the price. But if this is a friendly merger and you're the M&A banker on the other side, you now have a very strange mission, right? Because what do you have to convince the shareholders in the target company that they're getting a good deal? And what does that mean? The price they're getting paid is actually higher than the value. So at the same point in time, so you have two banks in New York and they're both trying to convince the, 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 the investors that they're getting a good deal. That banker has to say, the value is actually lower than the price, you're getting a really good deal. You say, how did they pull that off? This is why I think you see synergy and control show up because this way, the acquiring company's banker can push up the value saying that happens only if the merger occurs. You can't count on it if it doesn't. But again, you can see why M&A processes deliver such bias in valuation. As long as the deal makers are also the deal analysts, there is no way on God's good earth that you're going to get honest valuations because you're going to find a way to get the deal done. In a hostile acquisition, things get interesting because remember here, the target company doesn't want the deal to go through. The acquiring company wants to get the deal. Through. So if you're the banker for the acquiring company in a hostile, Acquisition, you got to be careful that you don't show too high a value because you know what the target company is going to do, right? They're going to go to their share and say, look, they value the company at 100, they're paying only 60. So you're going to kind of, you're still going to push up value above the price, but not too much. And on the other side of the transaction, if you're the banker now for the target company, you got to convince them that this deal is not good enough. So this is one of those few scenarios where both bankers come up with a value higher than the price. The acquiring company's banker does it to get the deal through. The target company's banker does it because he or she doesn't want the deal to go through. And finally, let's look at what happens if you're a buy side analyst. Buy side analysts don't work at JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, they work at Fidelity, T. Rowe Price, State Street. And the way it works is, you first cover a much wider range of stocks. You're not just 20, you might cover 150 or 200 stocks. And your job is to value these stocks for your portfolio managers. So when you value stock and you find it cheap, then the portfolio managers, they trust you as a buy side analyst will increase their holdings. But remember those portfolio managers, if you get hired, already have portfolios they've created. So let's suppose your portfolio manager owns a million shares of Tesla. I sent you the Tesla you know, valuation of the week. And I noticed that not a single person yet has found it to be undervalued. I'm, we're up to like 70 people on that Google shared spreadsheet. So let's say that you go to work for Fidelity. This manager owns a million shares of Tesla. I ask you, what do you think about Tesla? Sounds like he wants an honest answer, right? Let's face it, people do not like honest answers. They tell you they do. So you do your research, you come back to the portfolio manager and say, you know what, Tesla is overvalued. That's what you asked me, right? I can almost promise you that the reception you're going to get 
is not going to be a good one. Because if that portfolio manager owns a million shares, they want you to confirm that what they're doing is right. It's an unfortunate truth that human beings want confirmation. They don't want challenges. So if your portfolio manager is long on Tesla, you're more likely to find it undervalued because it makes the manager happy. And if that portfolio manager is, is, is short on Tesla, you go in the opposite direction. I'm trying to convey and this is something I'll, come, I'll talk more about today, that while you think about valuations as exercise in making estimates and trying to come up with an honest assessment, you cannot avoid the fact that bias enters the process in multiple ways. So file that away because today we're gonna to talk a lot more about bias and how it contaminates valuation because until we face up to that, so I'm going to reshare because this morning I had So this is that first introductory packet. It's not packet one. It's like a 21 kind of... So basically what we're going to do is do a big picture perspective on what's coming in this class. So when I first started teaching valuation, one of the questions I would get asked was, why do you do valuation? What's the point? And I had to think about it for a while. Because if you don't believe in valuation, what's the point of even doing valuation? And the answer I came up with is I do valuation to fight the lemming in me. You guys familiar with lemmings? They became famous or infamous in the 1950s, either because Disney had a movie about them or National Geographic, we don't know. There are all these conspiracy theories about how Disney actually had drums driving these lemmings off the cliff. Let's set it all to the side. The legend at least is that lemmings gather on a cliff, run right off the cliff into an ocean and commit collective suicide. So let's ask the question, why did they do it? You could see why the first lemming did it, right? He was going too fast, he couldn't stop, off the cliff, into the ocean. Incidentally, these guys can't swim, so that kind of seals the deal, dead. Second lemming, too close to the first guy, also in the ocean, also dead. But I'd like you to put yourself in the shoes of the very last lemming. I know lemmings don't wear shoes, but kind of hang in there with the analogy anyway. You're the very last lemming in this room. You're running as fast as you can towards a cliff. You've seen your entire tribe disappear off that cliff. I just seem to have second thoughts about what you were just planning to do, right? Your left brain, right brain, whatever part's rational saying, don't do it. And then you hear this voice in the back of your head. And you know what it says? They must know something that you don't. Remember those seven words. They must know something that you don't. The seven most deadly words in investing. I don't know how many of you tried to value Tesla yesterday, but as you value Tesla, you came up with a number well below the stock price. Well, your rational side said, I'm not buying Tesla. But you know what the voice in the back of your head was probably saying? They must know something that you don't speak in a monotone. Don't ask me why. And you're hearing it because you think about all those people who made money on Tesla. They must know something. You'll hear it when you value companies, especially if you get a price lower than the value for a company that's done, or a value lower than the price for a company that's done really well. And when you hear that voice, magical things start to happen to your valuation. Your growth rates go up, your cash flows get bigger, your discount rates get smaller, and your value keeps moving towards the price. Don't fight it. There's a lemming inside each and every one of you dying to get out. In fact, you can divide the whole world of investors into three groups of lemmings. The first group I call proud lemmings. I'm a lemming and I'm proud to be a lemming. They call themselves momentum investors, but it's pretty much the same thing, right? What do momentum investors do? They look for a crowd and they join in. You're buying, I'm buying. You're selling, I'm selling. Why are you buying? I really don't care. The second group of lemmings I call yogi bear lemmings. I don't know whether you've ever seen, uh, read the Yogi Bear comic, but he was smarter than the average bear. I think he lived in Yellowstone Park and he was the smartest bear of them all. Yogi Bear lemmings think they're smarter than the average lemming. You know what they want to do? They want to run with the crowd till the very edge of the cliff and at the last moment, bear away. Great if you can pull it off, right? You get all the upside of momentum and none of the downside. I can't pull off being a proud lemming. 
I am not smarter than the average lemming. I have no idea where the cliff is or when it's come. If you ask me to describe myself, that's me, a lemming with a life vest. That's all I aspire for. And that's what valuation gives me. It gives me a life vest. It says, look, even if everybody in the market changes their mind, you hold on to the cash flows because they're going to be there. I do valuation to slow the investment process because I, I know if I really, really want to buy something, I'm going to find a way to buy it. And be quite honest with yourself. If you really want to buy something, no valuation model is ever going to stop you because you're going to find a way to justify buying it. But all it does is gives you the time to stop and ask, do I really want to do that? And maybe that one time out of 10, when you listen to that inner voice, it'll save you some money. Valuation is all about developing that life first. And that's what we're aspiring to do in this class. So let's deal with some misconceptions in valuation that are widely held. And this to me is perhaps the most important slide for the whole class, because everything we're going to do in the class, everything you're going to do in valuation, these are the things you should be thinking about. One of the great misconceptions about valuation is valuation is an objective search for the truth. As you saw already, that's not true. First, even if you don't get paid to do a valuation, when you sit down to value a company, whether you like it or not, all of your preconceptions about the company come into that valuation with you. I'll give you a personal example. I have valued Microsoft every year since 1986. Between 1986 and 2014, every time I valued Microsoft, I found it to be overvalued. You name the price, it was overvalued at that price. $2, $5, $10, don't buy, don't buy. Strange, right? One of the great success stories of US equities in the last 50 years, I wouldn't have touched it between 1986 and 2014. Now, I can give you access to every single valuation I've done of Microsoft. You could dig through the spreadsheets looking for clues, but he'd be looking in the wrong place. If you really want to see why I found Microsoft to be overvalued, all you need to do is take a trip to the ninth floor. The finance department is go to 969, which is my office. Open the door, the door's actually not locked. And when you enter, here's what you're gonna see. Right in front of you, you'll see an iMac. To the left, you'll see my MacBook Pro. Next to my MacBook Pro, you'll see my iPad. My iPhone is right, here in my pocket, and my AirBuds Pro are probably sitting right on the desk. Don't take any of the stuff. Just look around, you're in Apple heaven. And in fact, if you look up on the top shelf, in my office, I have, my, I have a Mac 128K, the very first Macintosh I got in 1981. Cut a long story short. To me, Microsoft has always been the Darth Vader of technology. And if you're a Star Wars fan, let me be very specific about which version of Darth Vader I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the Anakin Skywalker, Darth Vader, episodes one, two, three. I'm talking Darth, Darth Vader, the guy who wears black, doesn't take a shower, speaks in this voice you can't quite get, but kills you on the drop of a hat. I have a lot of bad thoughts about Bill Gates. And they come bubbling up to the surface every time I sit down to value Microsoft. You see, what happened in 2014 that changed my view? I actually started feeling sorry for Microsoft because remember, this was the absolute bottom for Microsoft. Office and Windows were aging. Apple was taking off. And if I said, I feel sorry for these guys. It's very difficult to hate somebody you feel sorry for. And I ended up buying Microsoft in 2014 just because I felt sorry for them. My best investments have been driven by the worst of motives. But my point is, I was far too biased against Microsoft to value it objectively, and I knew it. You know who else I was far too biased to value? I kind of gave you a clue. I'm far too biased to value Microsoft because I hate the company too much. And I'm far too biased to value Apple because I love the company too much. In fact, if you visit my blog, I valued Apple in my blog for the first time in 2010. I valued multiple times. And if you go back to that first post I had on Apple where I valued the company, I spent half the post telling people, don't trust me. I love this company too much. I'm gonna to try to value the company, but I am biased. 
when you know a company really well, when you like its CEO, it's very difficult to come to the conclusion that it's overvalued. You know what? What do you think about Elon Musk? Will affect your valuation of Tesla. What do you think about Joe Rogan? Will affect your valuation of Spotify. There's no way you can hide from this. And to show you how bias can slip in, yesterday when I sent you that, that email with the Tesla valuation of mine and I started the Google search spreadsheet, I also sent you my valuation of the company, right? Do you think that might have colored your potential valuation? In fact, if I'd come up with a value of $2 trillion for the company, I'll wager there are far more of you would have found Tesla to be overvalued. I'm, I'm sorry, undervalued. I told you none of you has found, but maybe the fact that I put out my first valuation and said, I think Tesla is overvalued could have affected your valuations. The power of suggestion is incredibly strong. And I remember an investment banker saying, I can't seem to get my analyst. He's the, he was the head of IPO for one of the major investment banks. He said, I can't get my analysts to give me an honest assessment of value. I said, what do you do? He said, I give them the, you know, I assign them the company. I, I lead them through what the company's done. And I tell them, and I give them a task of valuing the company. And I said, before you give them the task, do you throw anything else out? He said, I do mention what I think the value should be. And I said, what do you find? He said, they come back with about the same number. I said, are you surprised? Bias comes from multiple places. And it's always there. You're saying, what do I do about it? There's nothing you, you can do about it. You're a human being. So you know what I suggest you do? Put down your biases on paper before you start working with the numbers. Now, a few of you said you'd picked a company. Somebody who, who's picked a company already, put up, put up their hands again. Okay, who are you valuing? Wipro. Wipro, okay. Now, before you even start valuing the company, do you have a sense of what you might Find you, you did you pick it because you think it's undervalued? I probably think it's undervalued. Okay. Okay. So that actually makes a difference, right? You interned there, you know much about maybe you like the people you interned with. You might have a different story if you interned there and they were miserable to you. They were good. So that affects your assessment. My guess is you're going to value the company and you're more likely to find it undervalued than overvalued because you entered the game expecting to see that. Yesterday, somebody you know in a different class that I'm teaching said they picked Alibaba as a company to value. You know why they picked Alibaba? Because over the last two years, Alibaba has lost 50% of its market cap. Because the Chinese government has kind of gone from ally to enemy and that's worked against Alibaba. And I said, what do you expect to find? He said, I think Alibaba is cheap. Now he's made that judgment before the valuation but that's human nature. When you pick a company, you almost always come in with some priors of what you expect to see. Maybe Jim Cramer yelled out in a moment. I mean, he yells out constantly. The company said, this is cheap. And you're a great believer in Jim Cramer and that's a company you're valuing. Guess what? The die might already be cast. So bias comes from your priors. And in statistics, there's an area called, of statistics called Bayesian statistics. If you've never heard of it. In Bayesian statistics, you're supposed to state your priors before you show me the results of your research. So let's say you're doing research on whether a drug works at treating cancer. You have to tell me upfront, I was paid by Pfizer to do this research. And this is a Pfizer drug. And I really, really think this drug is a good drug and expect to find it works. So what's the point? Because when I read your research report. I'm also going to read your priors. And if all you do is confirm your priors, I won't throw the report away, but I'm going to discount your findings. Wouldn't that be neat if every equity research analyst at the top of the report said, I really, really like the CEO of the company. They don't have to, right? Sometimes you can sense. I mean, I tell people, look, you hear an analyst talk about Elon Musk. You can very quickly predict whether he's going to have a buy on Tesla or a sell on Tesla without ever seeing the report. And as I said, if you get paid to do evaluation, you saw that in the, then all bets are off. You tell me how much you get paid 
and who pays you. I'll tell you which direction the buyer says and how much the buyer says. I'll give you a very, uh, you know, a story from almost 30 years ago to back this up. A company called Lynn Cable, a publicly traded company, had this agreement with AT&T where AT&T could buy 49% of Lynn Cable at an appraised value. So the agreement was actually written in terms of appraised value. So the time for the op, the, the appraise, the, the option to be exercised came about. And AT&T went out and hired Morgan Stanley. So you guys are gonna be Morgan Stanley. You're assessing the value of Lynn Cable so I can buy 49% of Lynn Cable. Lynn Cable went out and hired Lehman Brothers. I'm sorry to do this to you, but think of yourselves as pre-bankrupt Lehman Brothers. And you're assessing the value of the same 49% so Lynn Cable can sell the company. Same company, same point in time, same information. You got two investment bankers valuing the company. One investment bank comes back with $105 per share. The other comes back with $155 per share. So I'm gonna ask you to guess, who do you think came back with $105 per share? Is it Morgan Stanley or Lehman Brothers? And why? Who does Morgan Stanley work for? The buyer. If you work for the buyer, your job is to come in with the low ball number so I can get the shares at 105. So Morgan Stanley came back with 105. Lehman came back with 155. The difference was so large, they decided to call in a third investment banker. Why settle for two fees when you can have three, I guess. And they call in this outfit called Wasserstein Perella. I'm gonna say something incredibly harsh about these guys, but I mean every word of it. These guys could value a $20 bill in a brown paper bag if you put it in front of them. They'd invent a multiple enterprise value to cash in the bag, 3.3. Next thing you know, you'll be paying $66 for a $20 bill. But if you're Wasserstein Perella, and you guys can be Wasserstein Perella, you're stuck in the middle here. Yeah? You don't want to piss off either side too much because you've got to work with Morgan Stanley in the future and Lehman Brothers in the future. 105, 155, what's the safest place for you to be? Right down the middle, 130, right? They came back with $127.53. I'm going to give you a little secret in valuation. Don't let it out of this room. If you're ever asked to value something, never ever come back with a nice round number. Don't tell me the target price is $40. Tell me it's $38.87. It's amazing what that second decimal point will do in terms of creating an illusion that you know more than you do. When in doubt, add decimals. The intimidation factor is overwhelming. The broader lesson though is in most valuation, the value gets set first, the valuation follows. People decide how much to pay and they look for justification rather than let's do the valuation, decide how it's not the way it's supposed to work, but it's the way it does. So here's my suggestion to you. When you look at a valuation, ask yourself two questions. Who did this valuation? Who paid them to do this valuation? Before you even look at the numbers, because the answers to those two questions are going to tell you a lot more about what you see in the valuation than digging through the assumptions. So bias is the first big enemy. And as long as we hide from it, we're in denial, we'll never deal with it. It's a problem I've always I brought it up and I've given the keynote to the CFAs uh, for almost 30 years. I don't have a CFA. But if you, any of you are working towards the CFA, the AIMR makes a big deal. The CFA's parent organization makes a big deal about how CFAs are supposed to be objective, honest appraisers. I said, please stop lying. Let appraisers be open about their subjective judgments. It will create a much more honest conversation than hiding behind, look, this is an objective valuation. There are no objective valuations. The question is, how subjective and where's the subjectivity come from? Move on to the second big misconception about valuation. If I do a good valuation, I will get the right answer. You know when this gets started? Probably when you're in kindergarten. Your teacher comes up and puts a sheet of paper in front of you, two plus three. You wrestle and wrestle and come back with five. The teacher says, congratulations, you got the right answer. You get any other answer, he or she points out, say, you got the wrong answer. You must have done something wrong. 
And this gets drummed into you all the way through school. If you got the wrong answer, you must have done something wrong. And God help you. If you go on to get a quant degree, engineering, math, science, because this gets reinforced. If you got the wrong answer, you must have done something wrong. And then of course, we're in this class. And in the 36 years I've taught this class, I've always had this assignment, pick a company, you got valued over 15 weeks, and like clockwork every semester, and I will wager this semester is gonna be no different. Somewhere in the middle of the semester, about 15 or 20 people in the class, not everybody in the class, would show up in my office, mostly engineers or mathematicians or scientists. They'll put a valuation down on my desk and say, I'm done with my valuation. Can you take a look at it and tell me whether I got the right answer? I don't even bother looking at it. I push the valuation across the desk back to them and say, I don't know what the right answer is. And you can see that faith in the system start to crack. You're teaching this class. You don't know the value of every company. So it's my response is, if I knew what the valuation of every company was, why would I be teaching this class? I'd probably own all of Hawaii and have a couple of castles there. Some people can't handle this, not knowing what the right answer is. So you know what happens then? They become fixed income people. Let's face it, it's so much more comfortable sitting there with a bond, right? The maturity is given, the coupon is given. You might have to worry a little bit about default risk, but you don't have to worry about growth and margins. And I let them go because there's a nice, healthy recognition early in your life that valuing equities is not for you. The other half said, this is kind of fun. If you don't know what the right answer is, I can never ever conclusively be wrong. Think about this, one of the great things about valuing equities, you can never ever conclusively be wrong. I value a company and ask you to buy it. And it goes down five years in a row. You come back to me and say, what the heck did you do? You asked me to buy the stock, it's gone down every year. You know what my response is? Not a long enough time horizon. <laughs> You can never hold me accountable. How long? Well beyond my grave. How are you going to catch up with me? If the company goes bankrupt in the middle, I blame the system. That Lehman buy I put out in 2005, we're looking really good. If only they hadn't shut the damn thing down. I think it's fun not knowing what the right answer is. It makes people uncomfortable. And I'll tell you how it's going to show up. You're going, to, you know, you're going to pick a company and trust me, by the end of this class, you're going to value the company and you're going to look at the value and you know the question you're going to ask is, how do I know this is right? I'm going to save you the trouble. It's definitely wrong. I just don't know in which direction. And there is no way you can ever go through a checkbox and say, this is the right answer. We have consistency tests, which is what I'm going to do and say, this valuation looks internally consistent but when you send that valuation to me mid-semester to take a look at, I'm not gonna come back and say, this is the right valuation. I'm gonna say, this valuation is internally consistent. You can move on. But let's face it, not all companies make you equally uncomfortable when you try to value them. I'll give you an example from two years ago. As I think it was March, I don't know which week in March, two companies went public in the same week. Both companies, I'm sure you've heard of. One was a company called Lyft. Lyft actually came to the market before Uber. I mean, they beat Uber to the markets by, so the first ride-sharing company to go public. A company that was a money-losing company with small revenues, lots of potential. And the other company that went public in that same week was a company called Levi Strauss. You think Levi Strauss didn't go public till 2019? Levi Strauss used to be a public company in the, in the last century, was taken private by a group of private equity investors who took it back public in 2019. So ready? Levi Strauss and Lyft. Here's my first question. From both companies, you need to value the companies. To value the companies, you got to make forecasts for the future. Which of these two companies is going to be easier to value? Will you get a more precise valuation? It's the easy one, which one? Levi? Strauss or Lyft? It's going to be Levi Strauss. Why? Because you know what the company does. After all, it still makes money of a product that it came up with in what, 18? I don't know. I look at the back of my 501 to tell you which year. 
for 150. It still makes money on those denims. Let's face it, everything else is kind of a side story. It's got a business model, it's got lots of history. Valuing Levi Strauss is going to be easier than valuing Lyft. You're going to get a more precise valuation. So if you measure the quality of valuation based on precision, you're going to value nice, mature companies with long histories. You're going to keep patting yourself on the back on how good you are. But here's the problem. Everybody else valuing Levi Strauss will value it precisely as well because they have exactly the same advantages you do. In contrast, when you value Lyft, a bigger lift, right? There's not much financial data. The business model is still unformed. Companies losing money. Lots of questions about the future in terms of regulation and will it work? Much more uncertainty. Evaluation almost by definition is going to be more imprecise, not because you didn't do your job, but because there's more uncertainty in the future. You say, that's terrible. I have a big range on my valuation. Here's your saving grace. Because there's so much uncertainty, you know what most people who either buy or sell live to, they don't even try to value the company. You'd be amazed at how many VCs tell me that they don't do valuation. You know what the reason they gave for it is? Too much uncertainty. If you're valuing Lyft, I think you have a decided advantage over people who are other people in the market on Lyft because you're one of the few people who's even trying to fit a business model and trying to come up with a rabbi. In a strange way, the payoff to doing valuation is greatest when you feel uncomfortable. So as you value a company, you're pulling your hair out saying, I don't know whether Palantir is, I don't even know what business it is, there's so much uncertainty. Before you view that as a bad thing, think of it as an opportunity that this is the kind of company where most people give up. So I've asked you to pick a company, right? Some of you, in spite of my asking you not to, are going to reach out and say, I can't think of a company. Come on, guys, 45,000 companies, you can't think of one. But basically, you want me to pick a company. So I'm going to give you the advice you'd get if you send me that email, save you the trouble of sending you the email, and save me the trouble of replying. When you ask me, I can't think of a company to value, my advice is go where it's darkest. Find a nice Ukrainian mining company to value. Incidentally, there are no nice Ukrainian mining companies to value because you got the threat of a Russian invasion, you got strange things going on in the ground. But my, the reason I'm saying is most people give up. When there's uncertainty, they give up. Value companies when people are giving up. Value Peloton now. Don't wait for the story to unfold and more data to come in. Value Netflix right after that earnings report comes out. Today, PayPal announced an earnings report. The stock price collapsed. Value the company now, and people are saying, there's too much uncertainty. I'm not going to do it. So uncertainty is a feature, not a bug. Don't hide from it. Don't go into denial. Face up to it. And recognize you're not the only one who faces this. Everybody looking at the company, including the people within the company, are uncertain about the future. Bias, you've got uncertainty. Which brings me to the third big misconception about valuation. If I make my model bigger, it's going to get better. It's so easy to build big models now, right? I mean, I did my first valuation. I'm, you know, I'm giving away my age, but you can look it up anywhere online. I did my first valuation in 1981. I did it with a ledger sheet and a calculator. When you do your valuation with a ledger sheet and a calculator, almost by definition, you can't have too many line items because every single cell has to be hand calculated. I had like 12 line items. That was a lot. 12 times 10 is 120 cells, each of which had to calculate with a calculator. Today, think of sitting there with Excel. If you're an Excel ninja, you can write macros and macros on top of macros. And guess what? You can have 500 line items in evaluation. It's become easy to build incredibly complex models. And people think that's good, right? I can build this 500 line item valuation, but be careful because two things happen when you build these really big models. The first is the model becomes a black box. You feed numbers in, something happens, a value pops out. I'll give you the dead giveaway when an analyst is using a model and the model is running the analyst, not the other way around. You know what you're gonna see in the report? The model valued the company at. You know what the analyst is trying to say is, don't blame me, I just work for the model. 
It asked me for a number, I fed it the number. It asked me to go get a cup of coffee. I went back and got the cup of coffee. By the time I was done, it had pumped out evaluation. During the course of this class, you know, you're welcome to download whatever spreadsheet you want of mine. You can adapt it, you can modify it on one condition. When you turn in your final valuation, here are the words I don't want to see. The Demodoran model valued the company at, because I know exactly what you're trying to pull off here, which is you're saying, look, this value, I don't know, what, but your model did it. Hey, you're welcome to download the spreadsheet, but take ownership. It's just a tool. So first is models become black boxes. The second is you get what I call input fatigue. See, what is that? I'll describe it. And if any of you had a prior life where you worked at an investment bank, tell me whether you ever hit this moment. Usually hits around Saturday night at 11 o'clock. You're still at your desk working. Don't ask me why. You need this big model in front of you. And it requires 153 inputs, value and company. So you start entering the numbers. First input, second input. You get to the 12th input, the clock strikes midnight. You're not Cinderella. You look down, there are 141 more inputs to go. Your stomach drops. You look at the 13th input. It says, what was the inventory five years ago? Part of you wants to go look it up, but that part's too exhausted. And then another part of you prompts, just enter a random number. Let's move on. It's amazing how quickly the random numbers roll out, right? But when the output comes out, it all looks the same. The, the input you thought about for hours or days mixes in with the input that you just made up on the moment. They all come out looking exactly the same. Last summer, my youngest son, who was a junior in college, ended up with a job at a hedge fund, much against my advice, but he ended up there. And one of his jobs was doing valuations. So he never asked me for advice, but during the summer he called me and said, dad, you know, I'm gonna ask you a question on valuation. I said, now you are coming to me. So he said, yeah, you know, my, my boss has asked me to do a valuation. I said, okay, go do the valuation. He said, he's asked me to do a three statement forecast model. You know what a three statement forecast model is? Investment banks love this. You forecast the income statement, the balance sheet, the statement, the cash flows, every single item for the next 20 years. Amazing looking, but complete crap if you go beyond what you see as numbers. He says, Dad, how do I do that? I said, I don't know, I've never done it. He said, you've been teaching valuation for almost 40 years, you've never done this? I said, never in any valuation have I felt the need to forecast all three financial statements. He says, don't you need numbers from those statements? I said, I need six numbers. Why to be forecasting the other 144 when I need only six? Less is more in valuation. You want to build parsimonious models. If you can value an asset with three inputs, don't go looking for 10. If you can value a company five years of forecast, don't do 10 years of forecast. There is a price you're going to pay when you start adding detail just for the sake of adding detail. So when I think about these three forces, bias, uncertainty, and complexity, none of them are technical, right? But to me, they're the biggest enemies of good valuation. In fact, I call this the Bermuda Triangle evaluation. For those of you not familiar with the Bermuda Triangle, it's this mythical area in the Atlantic where ships and planes disappear. The Bermuda Triangle evaluation is where good sense disappears. And it happens because, not because you don't know what a beta is or what the risk premium is, it's because you're drowning in bias and uncertainty and complexity. So as you build valuation models, as you do valuations, be open about it this recognition that there's bias, that uncertainty is there and you got to deal with it. And that adding more complexity makes sense only if it delivers more information. Doesn't mean you're going to be okay, but it's going to take a huge amount of frustration off your shoulders. Any questions on these three, three forces? So let, go ahead. Is there a trade-off between what kind of information we can, you know, in our model to have that uh, quantitative aspect. Okay. Uh, you know. Remember the information is not for the past, it's for the future, right? So let's take an item that we see in cash flow calculations all the time, working capital. Change in working capital affects your cash flows. In 40 years of valuation, I've never once broken down working capital into its constituent 
parts. You know what I'm talking about? Inventory, receivables, payables. You're saying, why not? Because I'm incapable of forecasting receivables for the next 20 years. And if I cannot forecast it, what's the point of breaking things down into detail just for the sake of doing it? So my point of the information is take the information. So for Netflix, I can break down their revenues geographically. I can break it down by product. And you can forecast each product or each other. Do it if you feel you can bring some informational knowledge that, so you might say that revenues I get in India as Netflix are going to give me lower margins. Why? Because I charge only $4 a month. If you feel you can add some real information in terms of your estimates in there, break it into de detail. If not, why bother? So whenever you add a line of e detail, ask yourself, can I bring something that will allow me to value the company better? And the answer is no, don't do it. I almost never value a company with more than 10 line items. In fact, the more uncertain I get, guess what I do? I have fewer line items rather than more. Because the more uncertain I get, the less point there is to adding more detail. And I valued Paytm last year. I don't want to break things down into more detail. The company has no idea where it's going. How the heck am I going to get ahead of the company and make detailed forecasts of where it's going to make its money? So let's talk about the three basic ways you can put a number on an asset company. And I kind of introduced this. The first is intrinsic valuation, where you put a number on an asset based on its cash flows, its growth rate, its risk, and you come up with the value. The second is pricing, where you try to attach a number to an asset based on where other people are paying for similar ads. And I drew the contrast between value and pricing in the last class. And the third is there are some cases where, a cash, where, where an asset has contingent cash flows. If something happens, you get cash flows. A pharmaceutical company, where if a drug gets approved, you're going to get billion dollar cash flows. If not, you get nothing. A natural resource company, your oil prices go up, maybe your reserves are worth a lot. If not, nothing. Intrinsic valuation, price. There are only three ways you can put a number on an asset. People talk about hundreds of approaches in valuation. That's a lie. There are three basic approaches to putting a number. It's an intrinsic valuation, a pricing, or a real options contingent valuation. What I'd like to do a little bit is take these valuation approaches, which we're going to spend the bulk of this class talking about, and look at the basis for each approach. Before I do that though, no matter which of these approaches you use, you're making an assumption about how markets work. Specifically, you're making an assumption about whether markets make mistakes and what types of mistakes they make. Let's take an extreme scenario. Let's suppose you believe that markets don't make mistakes, that markets are efficient. Valuation becomes an intellectual exercise, right? There's no point. The value of a company is the market price. You ask me, which approach should I use? I say, it doesn't matter. The market's right already. So already you can see, no matter which of these approaches you're using, you're starting with a presumption of market mistakes. The question then becomes, what's different about these assumptions when I do intrinsic valuation versus pricing? And that's where we're going to go as part of this process. So let's start with intrinsic valuation. And the form you usually see it take, which is discounted cash flow valuation. Incidentally, you can do intrinsic valuation without doing a DCF. Pre 1930s, which is when DCF was concocted, people did intrinsic valuation. But now discounted cash flow valuations have become the vehicle for doing intrinsic valuation. So let's take a look at discounted cash flow valuation from a big picture perspective. What is it? It's that very first class you all get in finance. Remember that class? You're asked to buy a financial calculator. Maybe they've stopped doing that. And you come in and you start talking about present value. It's amazing how much of finance is that present value equation. The value of an asset is the present value of the expected cash flows of the asset. Philosophically, when you do a discarded cash flow valuation, you're assuming that there is an intrinsic value for every asset and that you hope to get a glimpse of it. In fact, I describe intrinsic valuation as a little bit like the search for the Holy Grail. It's been going on a long time, right? Nobody's ever found it. I think Indiana Jones came a little close, but he too missed it. But the idea there is, you know, when you do intrinsic valuation, you, you come up with a value, you really don't know whether you found the intrinsic value, but you hope, you keep the faith that there is an intrinsic value and you can estimate. 
And if you break down discounted cash flow models now, no matter how complicated you make them, they have three ingredients. They have a life for the asset you're valuing. Cash flows over that life or expected cash flows over that life and a risk adjusted discount rate on the cash flows. You can make this as messy as you want, but that's the end game. But let's step back and think about what needs to happen for you to make money on intrinsic valuation. Remember valuation is all about, it's a pragmatic exercise. You're trying to make money in evaluations. Let's see what you need to assume about the world for intrinsic valuation to actually make you money. First, you have to assume that markets make mistakes. That's actually an easy assumption to make. Even the firmest believer in efficient markets will go along with you. So you're right, markets do make mistakes and some big, some doozies. Second, you have to assume you can find these mistakes with your metrics and models. Now we're on dangerous ground, right? Why? Because the history of people who claim to find market mistakes is not that good. The average active portfolio manager underperformed the market, doesn't have, but let's say you're special. You have found a market mistake and you're right about the mistake. Let's give the mistake a name, Peloton. Stock at 25, you value the company at 40. And let's say you're right about the value. But the third assumption that needs to hold for you to actually make money, the price has to adjust to value. The market has to correct its mistakes. You know what, we all believe in market efficiency. The only question is when it happens. Somebody who's a pure believer says, it's already efficient, I'm not gonna try. You know what you do? You buy the stock because it's undervalued. and now markets are going to get efficient, I'm gonna make money. Very self-serving, but you need the third leg. So let's take a look at discarded cash flow valuation, both in terms of its pluses and minuses. Let's start with what I think is one of its biggest pluses. And a lot of people who are in the intrinsic value camp are also people who read Warren Buffett and believe in Warren. And one of the things that Warren Buffett has said that should resonate with you is he says, I don't buy stocks, I buy businesses. I don't buy a share of stock, I buy a business. And if you truly believe that, intrinsic valuation should be what you do because what are we trying to do in intrinsic valuation? We take your business, we extract the cash flows, we adjust for risk. So when you do intrinsic valuation, you're essentially buying businesses, you have to understand the business, and essentially you're coming up the value based on that. And the upside is you're no longer subject to the market moods and perceptions, right? You don't care what the rest of the world, at least in theory, cares about Peloton. It's all about the cash flows. And even if the market changes its mind and goes in the opposite direction, you still have the cash flows to hold on to, assuming you got them right. So the strength of intrinsic valuation is you're not waking up every day looking at the Wall Street Journal or at the end of every day looking at your phone and say, oh my God, my portfolio has collapsed because if you have faith and you bought these companies because of the cash flows, the cash flow should come and you should be okay, at least in theory. Here's the, the flip side of that. Because you are valuing companies, not pricing them, it does take a lot more work, right? In terms of inputs. I can price a company, the PE ratio in 15 other companies to value a company. I've got to delve into business models and cash flows and growth. So it is more work. And if your job is to invest across 2000 companies, you might not have the manpower to do intrinsic valuation. Already you can see why portfolio managers are more likely to do pricing than valuation because you've got too many companies in your potential universe. Second, and this is often a critique of discounted cash flow valuation, is we talked about bias, how you can make a valuation sing a tune that you want it to by playing with the inputs. And a lot of discounted cash flow valuations are horrifically bad in terms of how the inputs are estimated. I tell people, look, I'd much rather have an honest pricing than a bad discounted cash flow valuation. And I would say 90% of the DCFs I see, and there are some big names on top of them, are just bad DCFs. So it is true, you can use intrinsic valuation and play this game of feeding bias. In. But here's something to think about when you think about putting this into practice. Let's suppose you have 40 companies in a sector and you do an intrinsic value of every one of them. Is it possible that every single company in a sector 
could be under overvalued. Yeah, intrinsic valuation is all about business. So if I have the AI business and I've decided people are being over optimistic about AI, every company in the business could be overvalued. You think, so what? If your job is to stay invested in equities, you're an equity portfolio manager. You don't have the luxury of saying, I'm gonna sell all my stocks and go to cash. You have to hold stocks. What do you do then? If every company looks overvalued, you either have to shut down your fund which might not even be in your control, or find another way of investing in stocks. Now, do you see the other reason portfolio managers are going to stay with pricing? Because with intrinsic valuation, it's entirely possible you'd have left the market entirely. Now, we talk about Warren Buffett, and people often forget one of the reasons the legend is formed around him. He formed a partnership in the 1950s to invest in stocks. And in the partnership, he described himself as a value investor, and he said, this is how I think about stocks. And and the partnership did pretty well. And then you got to 1969, stock prices had hit a high. And one of the most famous letters of all time, and you can find it on Google if you, if you type in the letter, he wrote a letter to his, the people who were partners in his investment partnership. And here's what he said. He said, I, we're at a point in the market where I have two choices. I can stay true to my intrinsic value roots, but nothing looks cheap. Or I can abandon my intrinsic value roots and find a way to buy 30 or 40 companies. And he said, I am not willing to do the latter. So I'm giving all the money back to you as partners. That takes both guts and, and power, right? He would ran his own partnership. Imagine working at Fidelity and you're a mutual fund manager and you decide tech stocks are overvalued, you the Fidelity tech. Fund. Can you imagine sending a letter out to your, and said, look, we've decided to liquidate the fund. You'd be fired and let out in handcuffs, and somebody else is going to run your fund? If you think about that, what you need for discounted cash flow valuation to work. Remember I said the three ingredients, you got to find a mistake, you got to, and then you got to invest in that mistake, and then you got to hope that markets correct the mistakes, right? You say, how do I make sure markets correct the mistakes? You cannot, that's why we call it fate. But here's a consolation price. The longer your time horizon, the greater the chance, assuming you were right, that you were right in the first place, that missed, no guarantees, but still chances improve. Now I'm going to be very explicit. When I say long time horizon there, I'm talking years, three years, five years, 10 years. So let's talk about what the ingredients are for intrinsic valuation to be the right choice for you. First, you should be valuing assets to generate cash flows. If you're trading currencies or cryptos, don't even come to me for an intrinsic value model. It's not going to work. Second, you have to have either a really long time horizon so you can let the mistake play out, or you've got to be capable of providing the catalyst that causes market correct. You think, what are you talking about? Take a look next time Carl Icahn takes a position in a company. You know what he does? He takes a position. And then he's on CNBC almost instantaneously, and he's telling you all of his reasons, not because he's, he's being altruistic and he wants to share his reasoning. What's he, hoping you, what's, what's he hoping you will do? That you will listen to him and go buy the shares. Push. In other words, he's trying to act as a catalyst for correction. It's an advantage that big activist investors have over you and I, is when Bill Ackman buys Peloton, it's not some silent transaction. He's hoping to convince other people to correct the mistakes. So when you think about whether you should be in intrinsic valuation, think about your time horizon. Think about whether you can be the catalyst. Here's the final thing you need to think about. The nature of intrinsic valuation is you're often going against the crowd. You're buying when other people are selling. You're selling when other people are buying. You're saying, so what? Some of us are more naturally susceptible to peer pressure than others. Think back to your high school days. Do you want to hang out with the cool kids? Or were you okay by yourself? And there's a lesson there because if you are susceptible to peer pressure, you're almost incapable of being a, an intrinsic value investor because no matter what your intellectual reasoning is, you will not be able to withstand the fact that everybody else disagrees with you. There's a psychological component here. So there is no guarantee intrinsic valuation is right for you. Dig a little deeper. Any questions on intrinsic valuation? 
talk about pricing. In pricing, you try to attach a number to an asset based on what other people are paying for similar assets. Philosophically, you've given up on intrinsic values. I don't know what it is. I don't know whether, whether it's around. I can never measure it, so I'm going to give up on it. I'm going to price it. So you, you lost the faith. But if you break down pricing, no matter where it is, whether it's real estate or stocks, here's, here's, here's what you're going to see. First, you're going to see either an identical asset, which is very difficult to find, or a group of assets that you claim are very much like it. We get really sloppy in equity research, right? What do steel analysts do? They take a steel company compared to other steel companies, which might work. But if you take a software company compared to other software companies, you're really reaching, right? Because some software companies are high growth, some are low growth, some are high margin, some are low margin. But you start with that list of what you think are comparable companies. And then you discover very quickly that you can't compare the price per share across companies. Why? Because price per share is a little arbitrary. You know, Tesla's stock price dropped about 80% in March of 2020. You know why it dropped 80%? They had a 5 for 1 stock split. When you have a five for one stock split, the number of shares goes up by fivefold. The share price go, it's, it didn't become cheaper or more expensive. The, the price per share is a function of things you do to share count. So what do we do? We can't compare price per share, we standardize price, which is what a multiple is, right? You divide the price by earnings, price by book, enterprise value by EBITDA. So the second ingredient in pricing is a standardized price. So you've got comparable assets, you've got a standardized price, and then you spin a story. What does that story look like? And I remember reading, I mean, there was an equity research report that I read where if you take the market cap of every automobile company and divide by the number of cars that that company sold, you get a market cap per car. If you do that for Tesla, you got a half, uh, you know, half, you know, half a million cars and your market cap is a trillion, trillion divided by half a million, you get this huge number. If you do that for GM or Ford, you get a much smaller number. So if you just base your investment decisions on how low that number is and that's cheap, you're going to be buying GM and Ford and selling Tesla. But of course, an equity research analyst who wants to put a buy recommendation in Tesla, here's what you do. He said, that number looks really high, but guess what? Tesla has much higher growth than these other companies, much higher margins. It's really a technology company. Now, you might, might or might not buy that story, but every pricing has comparable assets, a standardized price, and a story. And let's think about what kinds of assumptions you're making about the market. When you take 50 software companies and you compare the pricing, you know what you're implicitly assuming? That the market is right in the aggregate across companies, but it makes mistake on individual companies. It's a very different assumption than what we did in intrinsic valuation. But then you follow by saying market mistakes like that are much more noticeable. So if you're a company that trades at five times earnings in a sector where everything trades at 20 times earnings, people notice it much more quickly. And if they notice it much more quickly, corrections happen much more quickly. The time horizon now can be much shorter and you can get away with it because it's, not as, it's, it's unlikely that this will stay underpriced for the next 20 years. So if you think about what the advantages of pricing are, they're almost the flip side of what you saw in discounted cash flow valuation. The advantage of pricing is you'll always find something underpriced because it's, all, it's relative. Everything could trade at you know, huge multiples of revenues, but if you're looking for the cheapest company on a pricing basis, 50 times revenues might be cheap if everything else trades at 150 times revenues. So you're always going to be able to find something to buy or sell in a sense, you're in sync with the market. You're, you're, when you're doing pricing, you're staying with the market mood for better or worse. So if you're a lemming, you're running with the lemmings. That's the nature of the process. If you all go off the cliff, you might just go off a little later than everybody else, but you're going off the cliff with them as well. So there's always going to be stocks that come in as underpriced. And if your job as a portfolio manager is to make sure that you're always investing in equities, Pricing will always give you things that look cheap or expensive. So a little later, we're going to talk about one of the disadvantages of pricing and then how portfolio managers can even take that disadvantage and turn it to their, to their advantage. But it's true, pricing requires less information than discarded cash flow valuation, and something's always going to look cheap. Which brings you, you go ahead. So can you combine? 
combine the both of them? The don't, and don't ever do that. It drives me crazy when I see people saying, I got a DCF value of 50 and a pricing of 30. I'm going to average it and give you 40. This is like saying you're going to be a Muslim for the first half of the day and a Buddhist for the second half. This will not end well. Because philosophically, they're very different ways of attaching a number to an asset. Make up your mind and stick with it. If you want to trade, price things. If you want to invest, value things. Don't bring a baseball bat to a soccer game. In other words, don't bring a DCF to a pricing. Don't bring multiples to a valuation. And you're always going to be a little safer than trying to mix the two. We think about the disadvantages of pricing. Remember, when you find something to be underpriced, if everything is overvalued, guess what you found? You found the least overvalued company in the sector. So I'll give you the consolation price. When there's a correction, your stock will drop only 30% and everybody else will drop 50%. You still will lose money, but less money than others. And here's why portfolio managers are okay with it. If you get a chance, visit the Morningstar site or Lipper, they both they rank mutual funds. You know how mutual funds are ranked? Not based on absolute performance, but relative to other mutual fund managers. I'm just putting another nail into the coffin of why portfolio managers don't use DCFs. Pricing is your game because you get, your job is to stay in Western equities and you get judged relative to other people. Pricing works much better for you. So I, I want you to not walk in. So if you get hired at Fidelity, to walk, not walk and say, I'm a true believer in DCFs. How come you guys are using multiples? There's a reason why pricing stays around in some sectors. It's because you have a different agenda. And one other point, you know, it's true on the surface that pricing looks like it needs fewer inputs. One of the things I'm going to show during the course of this class is whether you like it or not, implicitly, when you do pricing, you're making the same assumptions about cash flows, growth, and risk. You're just making them under the surface. And I'm going to bring them above the surface. That's actually a very healthy thing to do in pricing. When you pay 50 times earnings for a company, you are implicitly assuming high growth in the company. And I'm going to actually put a number and say, this is your growth rate. Are you okay with it? So let's think about when pricing works best. First, it works best when you're trying to price an asset where there are other assets just like it. Now, do you see why pricing works better in real estate than in stocks? It's easier to find five houses just like yours than it is to find five stocks just like yours. It works best when you have multiple assets that look very much like each other, they're all priced. You know why pricing doesn't work with Picasso's? There aren't that many around and very few transactions happen in Picasso's. People try it. And that's why when you have to price fine art, what do you have to do? You have to hire some expert who charges you this hefty fee because pricing gets so much more difficult. And if you think about what you need as an individual for pricing to work for you, first, your time horizons can be much shorter. So you're not the kind of person who can't wait for five years, six months or three months of your time horizon. It works better if you're judged against other people and how they're doing rather than against an absolute basis. But there's actually a group of people for whom pricing works better than the rest of us. Remember when you price something, it may be either underpriced or overpriced, right? When you buy something underpriced, you hope the price will go up and it's overpriced, it'll come down. Now, most mutual funds are long only. They can only buy stocks. So when they do pricing, they have to go buy, find something underpriced and hope it goes up. The essential difference between a hedge fund and a mutual fund is hedge funds, at least in theory, can both be both long and short. Do you see how this could help you in pricing? If you think five stocks are underpriced and five are overpriced, if you're a hedge fund, you can go long on the five underpriced, sell short on the five overpriced. And if you're right, you make money in both directions and the market can be completely wrong and you're still okay because you're making money on relative adjustment. If you're a really good pricer as a hedge fund, and most hedge funds, when they talk about quant approaches, they're not talking about quant approaches to make intrinsic valuation better. It's about quant approaches to do pricing better. You can see why the end game is so much more lucrative. So I'm going to leave you with one final slide. Sometimes it's good to know what you cannot do. 
So when I look at something and I want to put a number on it, I would broadly categorize almost everything I see into one of four groups. The first is going to be an asset, a company, a business, a share of stock in a company. I can both value the company using a discounted cash flow model and I can price the company. So when you look at stocks, you can price stocks, you can value stocks, you can pull off both. If I come to you with a commodity, oil, gold, gold actually, let's put this aside because gold is less commodity and more collectible, oil or iron ore. It's true, you could build this macro model for valuing it, right? Have you ever seen macro models for oil? They take the total production of oil around the world, make estimates about shale oil versus traditional oil. They make assessments about supply. They try to... Those macro models almost never work. There are too many things that, cannot, that are out of your control. So what do most people do with commodities? They just price them. Oil is priced. Iron ore is priced based on demand and supply. If you have a currency, don't even try to value a currency. There is no value for the dollar, no value for the Swiss franc, no value for Bitcoin, because currencies can only be priced against each other. It's an exchange rate. Currencies can only be priced. They cannot be valued. And finally, if you have a collectible, I gave you the example of Picasso. What's the intrinsic value of Picasso? Are you kidding me? There are no cash flows that come out of Picasso's. It's entirely based on demand and supply. So if everybody comes to agreement with my son and says, this guy can't put the nose in the right place, there goes $200 million. It can only be priced. Gold can only be priced. And this is where the Bitcoin debate comes down, right? If you think Bitcoin is currency, you can't price it. If you think it's a collectible, it cannot be priced. So when somebody says, well, is Bitcoin undervalued? My answer is, I have no idea. You can't value Bitcoin, but I can price it. When something can be both valued and priced, there are bounds where you can say, this is truly crazy. So if Tesla goes to $10,000 per share based on demand and supply, you might step back and say, there's no chance that the value is 10,000 because you can't sell enough cars, even if they've got a 100% market share to get there. Value puts upper and lower bounds. But if you ask me what's the highest price Bitcoin can take, you know what the answer is? There's no upper bound. We ask you what's the lowest number Bitcoin can go to. I used to think I knew the answer till 2020. What's the lowest price you can see for something? I thought it was going to be zero. You know what corrected this misconception? In April of 2020, oil prices and it was just US crude, not Brent crude, dropped to minus $35 a barrel for a couple of days. We'll come back and talk about why that might happen, but it shows you pricing is completely boundless. It's demand and supply, and whatever the reasons, the price can go off the high end and drop down the line. So think about this breakdown because it will save you an incredible amount of frustration and time. Because if you try to value something that cannot be valued, you're going to waste your time. You're going to spin your wheels trying to do it. So when we come back, I, you know, I mentioned very briefly. In fact, I won't even do the rest of these slides. Take a look because you know, it's about how options can help you. But as I said, that's not much. You now we'll come back to it later. Next session, we're going to start on the first lecture note packet. So bring that packet with you because we're going to start to talk about discounted cash flow valuation and how to put them into class. Oh, yeah.